This is Duke University. For more than 20 years, Raquel Zepeda has been one of the more critical voices within hip hop. These days, she's a wife, a mother, and of course, an author. Today, Raquel Zepeda joins us to talk about her new book, Bird of Paradise, How I Became Latina. I'm Mark Anthony Neal, and this is Left to Black. Yeah. Eric, you're a real life Eric. G for this one. <laughs> yeah. Welcome to Left to Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal. We're joined this afternoon by writer and filmmaker Raquel Cepeda. She's director of the film Bling, A Planet Rock. She's the editor of the groundbreaking anthology, And It Don't Stop, the best hip hop journalism of the last 25 years. And she's the author of a brand new memoir. Bird of Paradise, How I Became Latina. How are you doing today, Raquel? I'm awesome, especially after that introduction, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Neil. <laughs> so, so let's just jump into this. You know, as I, you know I, I don't get a chance to read enough these days, and I'm always reading for the purpose of doing something, writing something, or teaching something. Um, and your book you know, gave me this wonderful opportunity to do kind of like all these things together. I, I mean, I was absolutely entranced by the language, the use of your language, the way that you take us on this transnational trip, um, the way that you echo, you know, what for me as was for you growing up in New York City in the 1980s, um, you know, with this early moment of hip hop just coming out of the subways, coming out of the street. It's an amazing story. So, so tell us how you got to tell this story. Um, I what mean, made I you lived it? Yeah, Did you have to live it before you tell it. I mean, but you know, part of it is that you know you've obviously lived with this story all your life. You know, why do yeah. you feel so compelled to tell this story now? Because I feel like you know Latinos are not really represented correctly mm -hmm. um, in the media, you know, in mainstream and popular culture. I mean, even even in this book, for example, this is the first uh, memoir, nonfiction book by a Dominican American writer of my generation. There's one more book um, by you know a woman who's a little bit older than my mom, that takes place in a, in another country. So this is like a real Dominican American story. So you know, I you know I feel honored that I'm the first, but I also feel like there should be a groundswell, more voices because we are very diverse. There's over 50 million Latinos. And I felt like this book also um, was my way of showing people in the diaspora how much we have in common, how much how, we're so much more similar than we are, you know, different. I mean, that's one of the interesting challenges, right? Because when you think about a, a Latino, Latina community, it's hyper visible, particularly around conversations about immigration, but in many ways, invisible. Um, you know, the way that, for instance, political spokespersons and commentators lump a whole Spanish speaking community together, you know, where folks are literally coming from all these different places. And all the conversations these days about transnationalism, right? When folks think about transnational populations, they're thinking about, you know, adopting the adoption of Chinese children. You know, they're thinking about, in some ways, African diaspora. They're not thinking about, you know, Dominicans who grew up in New York. <laughs> in the Dominican Republic. Yeah. Uh, and so in many ways, what your book does is really make visible this population and, and allows this population to kind of tell stories. Um, you know, the backstory of your book, of course, is this relationship between you and your parents. Um, your mother, who was largely absent, you know, and when you were growing up, and then this really kind of interesting relationship with your father. How has, what has their response been to the book? Well, I haven't seen my birth mother since I interviewed her that day. And wow. I actually wrote that I didn't think I would see her again. And I don't really know if I will see her again um, because I never really got to know her well. Um, I just don't feel a connection or feel um, a desire to reach back out. But if she were to, you know, give me her comments about the book, I'll gladly accept them. You know, um, I can't imagine that she'd be very pleased with it. But I mean, I was as honest as I could be in writing this kind of a book. And also, I tried to be very empathetic to her situation mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. try to really, you know, I mean, she was 17 years old. She didn't know English, you know, she came here and, you know, she had her own dream and her dream was to be my father's queen. And, you know, my father was like a pimp, um, a player. So it just wasn't going to happen for her. So, you know, um, it, it, it must be I can imagine for her that it's probably going to be kind of a painful read if she decides to read it. And, um, you know, my father and I still have this very snarky kind of strange relationship. <laughs> and um, after I interviewed him, 
um, for the book, he kind of doesn't really bring it up too much. I think that the way that he apologizes for, you know, the kind of parent that he was, was is by being so present for me now and also being a wonderful grandparent. So, you know, I mean, you know, he's kind of old school. I don't think he, he sees that he did anything wrong. <laughs> As much as he pushed you in terms of being the great tennis player, you know, are, those, are there any moments when you see Venus and Serena and say to yourself, well, maybe that could have been me? Well, they liked, I, I believe they liked tennis. I hated it. <laughs> yeah, right. I hated that's, it. Yeah. I know. So, I mean, you can't devote your life to something that you, you despise. You know what I mean? So, yeah. I, I, you know, I play for fun sometimes, but I really don't, I don't like it. I don't like it at all because of, you know, all the stuff that's in my book, you know? But yeah. the good thing you know, if I had to take out a positive, extract a positive out of the whole situation, it taught me how to, you know, have a drive and mm -hmm. how to, you know, mm -hmm. um, work for myself, how to meet deadlines, how to be, you know, driven in that way. So, I mean, if I had to look at a, you know, extract something positive out of that experience, I would say that's it. We're here with Raquel Cepeda, who's the author of the new book, A Memoir, Bird of Paradise, How I Became Latina. Your book is also really a story about community. Um, and, and all throughout your life, you tell these stories of, of, these play, of these folks, these people who provided a home space for you, you know, a safe haven for you. Um, how important was you f to be able to celebrate some of these folks? Right? And some of these folks weren't always nice folks, right? They had their own issues. Um, but given particularly your father's own experiences being abandoned when he was a child in New York City, you know, how important was it for you to be able to locate these kind of extra families, if you will? Well, you know, I didn't know that my father was abandoned as a child in New York yeah. City until this project. Yeah. You know, um, he's of a generation that's very quiet, that don't really wear their emotions on their sleeves unless it's kind of a negative emotion. He has his own stresses. So one of the things that were kind of that was kind of cathartic that came out of the, this experience was the fact that, you know, I found out that his you know, he was informed by, you know, by, he was in a very dark place himself. I didn't even know he was here at 12 or 13. I thought he was in DR. Um, I don't really know a lot of people on his side of the family either. So I didn't know it was a mystery to me. So I was, you know, kind of like, it was an exhaling, it was an mm -hmm. exhale moment um, mm -hmm. for me to find out that, you know, he went through his own stuff. Um, and community for me, even before I knew this, because I, like I said, I just found this out, um, is was really, really important. And um, I was really blessed to be able to be raised and, you know, in a time in New York City where on the one hand, we felt kind of invisible being young people with the whole, you know, Yousef Hawkins, um, mm -hmm. Bernard Goetz, just, you know, being accused of everything, you know, graffiti and everything else. You remember, we were public enemy number one, two, and three, right? right. Back in that time. Right. So to find a place that, you know, wasn't always positive, wasn't always negative, but was warm and safe and welcoming all the same is something that I will always carry with me and actually informs everything that I do today. One of the things that's also very interesting about your book, particularly as you talk about this kind of moment when you become, like many of us, entranced with hip hop, and you know, younger folks might not get it these days because you know, hip hop is still is framed now as such a kind of a multicultural experience. Um, mm -hmm. But there still are kind of rigid lines in hip hop in the 1980s about who can be part of that community, and and in many ways, your embrace of hip hop is transgressive, right? And you talk about this in the book, you know, folks kind of pushing back that that's black stuff. Right. Why are you so interested in listening to the black stuff? Um, how did you negotiate, you know, share with the audience how you negotiated this kind of space where hip hop might not have necessarily been open armed towards your presence, you know, in that space at that time? Well, you know, when I say I love hip hop, I don't love rap music. It's, you know, yeah, all I the tennis. We were celebrating hip hop in a more holistic fashion back I in that you. back in that time. You. And you know, other Latino Americans, American born Latinos, um, were dancing and DJing and rapping and doing their right. own thing. So for me, it's a very it was very intrinsic. I didn't have a moment where I was like, Okay, and right now I'm going to adopt hip hop culture and it will be, you know, <laughs> I you know, I will become part of it and it will become part of me. No, it was very a very natural kind it's of organic, thing. Right. Um and you know, I when I read books now and I hear people talk about hip hop now, it's always usually people who didn't even grow up here. Mm -hmm. Um it's it's more of a divide, like, you know, it was a black thing, it was a, you know, this thing, that thing. It was actually a black thing, a black American thing, a West Indian American thing, a Caribbean Latino American thing, and a, you know, white American thing. You know, they were, remember some of the, the some of our graffiti artists right, were, were, white, were white kids, right? In the Northeast Bronx, yeah. White kids yeah. from the Upper West Side that yeah. weren't poor. 
but right. the, in their own way felt disenfranchised. So, you know, it, it's it, hip hop, I believe, was a lot more multicultural back then than it, it, than it is today. Yeah. You know, before it went pop and before people, you know, it was, you know, Kanye West was selling millions of records in Paris. Um, <laughs> naturally, you know, when it wasn't really making a lot of money, there were people in France and in Brazil, all over the world that were thirsty for this because, as you know, hip hop from almost the beginning was a uh, cultural export. So let me put you on the spot. Um, you know, a few years ago, you published this incredible collection of hip hop journalism. Um, and, and I think those of us who've been reading your work and other folks' works for a long time can literally look at some of these pieces and remember when we might have read them, you know, in the Village Voice or, or, or oh, wherever. Yeah. Um, how do you feel about hip hop journalism today? I mean, how do you feel about pop culture journalism these days? Well, you know, I don't want to sound like an old fart or somebody who romanticizes the past, though I don't think there's anything wrong Sorry. with remembering the past. Yeah. And you kind of have to know where you came from to know where you stand and where you're going. We've heard this adage before, right? Um, you know, I thought it was a lot more interesting back in the day just because it was, you know, people, the writers were kind of figuring out what is this thing, like Stephen Hager in The Village Voice in 1982, like, what is this thing, you know? Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot a lot of the rappers also and the, and, the, and the dancers and the people that were in the community holistically were more available to writers and we got a chance to spend more time with them, et cetera. So it was kind of like, a, you know, I feel almost the energy jumping out of the page. Um, you know, now, obviously, if you get five minutes with Jay-Z, unless you're, you know, um, actually outside of the hip-hop community, it's almost impossible to get. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the, the writing is, you know, there's good writing out there. I mean, you know, I, I also, you know, I mean, what can I tell you? Um, there's some good writing out there. There's not, it just doesn't have, to me, kind of lacks the passion, and it's not because of the writers. It's more because of the Internet age. There's less, you know, there's less interaction. You know what I mean? So yeah. it's really not so much on the on the writers themselves, but just on the time that we're living in, you know? And the cool thing is hip hop is still embryonic. We don't know where it's going tomorrow. One right. thing we do right. know is that it's not going anywhere. Right. We're with Raquel Zapata, who's the author of the brand new memoir, Bird of Paradise, How It Became Latina. She's also the editor of the groundbreaking anthology, and it don't stop the best hip hop journalism of the last 25 years, and also the director of the film, bling a planet rock uh, th there's a way in which your book is also functions like a like a travel log um, you know in, in academic circles there's all this conversation about you know cosmopolitanism and in cosmopolitan bodies and and in very often black bodies are left out of that conversation uh, black and brown bodies um, you know some scholars uh, Ashil and Bimbe, for instance here do talks about this concept of, of being afropolitan you know, Africans of the world. Um, one of the things that your book does really talks about the fact that, you know, we are literally a people of the world. And, and, and what your book captures is that you've had the opportunity to travel to all these places. Um, so, you know, first we talk about this kind of, you know, DR New York thing. Um, and you get a little bit of time in San Francisco with your birth mom at some point. Um, but of course, you know, once all this stuff comes together with you, you know, you go on this DNA search. Um, that takes you to other parts of the globe. Talk about this kind of split in the book, half memoir and half detective Chronicle. story, right? Yeah. It's a, yeah, exactly. It's part memoir and part detective story, exactly. I've always wanted to try to find a way to sneak travel in because I don't <laughs> see enough, I don't yeah. see enough work yeah. Yeah. for people of point. color, communities of color, writers of color you know, about their travel experiences. Yeah. And one thing, actually, I was skimming through Elizabeth Gilbert's Eat, Pray, Love, uh, because at the time that the movie came out, you know, I was interested in seeing what the hoopla, what the whole yeah. everything was about. <laughs> and one thing that stood out to me in her writing was, she said, um, you know, when I, when I travel, I think she was talking about Italy, maybe, you know, I stand out, I'm a wasp, I'm very white, I get red, you know, I'm blonde. And then I, like the polar opposite, I blend in everywhere I travel, <laughs> almost everywhere. I mean, if I'm in, you know, for example, Sierra Leone, um, I, I could be Lebanese right. or, right. you know, I've been asked if I was Eritrean or whatever. You, you kind of blend in as a, you know, as a, as a global citizen. And that, for better and for worse, um, allows you to have a different experience. And But every time I travel, I always feel, of course, there's nothing like New York City, you know, but I always feel like more and more and more grounded in the earth. And like my family just expands and expands. Yeah. In, in Morocco, yeah. they say yeah. that, yeah. that, you know, when God came down, he created 40 people. 
that look just like you scattered around the world. And every time I travel, I believe that's true. You know, <laughs> I do. It's like I just see myself in the in the eyes of people all over the world. We're here with Raquel Cepeda, and, and, and Raquel, one of the things I want to ask you, particularly in relationship to trying to get this book published, um, were there difficulties trying to get publishing houses to understand what this story was? I mean, you mentioned the fact that, you know, that literally of, of your generation, no, you know, nonfiction, you know, Dominican American stories. Um, you know, did the publishers get it when you first presented it to them? Or, no. Or, <laughs> <laughs> um. No, they did not get it. Um, I have an amazing agent named Aisha Pande, and she's like a woman of the world herself. Mm -hmm. um, she's Indian and German, but looks Dominican to me. Um, <laughs> I think if you mix anything, that creates Dominican. To me, you know, Barack Obama, our president is Dominican. Dominican. Dominican president. Okay. <laughs> so, um, you know, you you um, you know, you put the you do your best to write a great proposal. You t you bring you know you put it out in the world, and sometimes people like didn't get the DNA thing. One person told me, you know, um, you know we're all American. You know that's in the past, and you have people in the publishing world living in this bubble. They kind of never step out of their offices, <laughs> that's funny, and then all of a sudden, you know, like to them, the post-racial society, not in every instance, but in many cases, is real. You know, right, right. so I remember just sitting there and being so depressed after having this one conversation like this after the other. Who cares about race? It's all, you know, and we're all living in a, you know, it's, it's it's all, it's now you have Barack Obama. You know, who cares? We're all American. But of course, the people that, you know, and, and they talked about, you know, their families uh, being um, immigrants. But the thing that they have that I don't have is that their family came from like Eastern Europe and they came from countries, Scandinavia, countries that you become kind of white when you, you know, when you, when, you when you're here States, for a few yeah. generations. And then the stigma of being a person of color, you know, of belonging to a community of colors erased right we're ghettoized yeah right so i mean i got very lucky you know i met with um malaika darrow who puts out great wonderful work yes. i don't know where publishing would be without her to be honest <laughs> i mean you know so she got it instantly and you know and and i believe in my guides you know i believe in spiritual guides and something just happened that led me to you know the right place and i believe that if, if i didn't have her as an editor that this book may have come come out a little differently and like maybe you know sanitize if you will yeah uh, what do you hope the impact of the book will be well i hope that it has a long life i hope <laughs> that it's adopted in in, in, in universities castles, yes. you know <laughs> it, nationally internationally because i think this is you know an important voice I don't care if somebody agrees or disagree, you know, or disagrees with it. It's okay. What I care about is having conversations and debates. And you know, I hope that this book could be a point of departure for different, you know, people, community, white, black, Latino, to come and see how you know this side of America lives and how they are similar and sep and different, but similar, really mostly similar to us. The day that we're taping this, of course, is, is your release day. Um, yeah. and, and I got a chance to see a little shout out, you know, thanking everybody who, you know, shouted you out about release day on Facebook. How has social media changed? Um, how, you know, one publishes and markets a book? Um, you know, do you see it as a tool? Do you see it as something that, you know, changes that kind of one on one interaction that, you know, you had to have in a bookstore, say, 20 years ago? Yeah, I think bookstores are becoming irrelevant. Yeah. Um, one thing I can say is that um, you can't find my book in Barnes & Noble because of a dispute between my parent company, Simon & Schuster, and um, Barnes & Noble over money. So now, you know, Barnes & Noble are now becoming bullies for, to writers. Right. And I say whatever because we're in a very sophisticated age where, you know, sooner than later, we're, they're going to go. And actually, I think that a rebirth of independent bookstores, a very cool creative book are, is, right. is gonna happen. Right. Um, right. We're gonna go back to, my, things got, have gotten so big that they're gonna explode and we're gonna go back to this whole mom and pop yeah. Yeah. Um, idea, which I'm very excited about. So, you know, good riddance to Barnes and Noble, but you can find my book <laughs> online and in independent right. bookstores. And the cool thing about, um, you know, being, uh, making yourself available on social networks is that you can talk to people one-on-one, -on -one, right. you know, right. whether they agree or disagree, I don't, it's not my, I don't really care. I just like to have the conversation and I feel like, you know, you can talk to so many more people than if you do like an old school book tour that's expensive, you know, people sometimes miss, they, they you know, I think to me it's more intimate. It's more yeah. intimate to have, as they say, a Skype tour 
than yeah. it is to go to a bookstore these days. Absolutely. You know uh, what I mean? So The one thing I know about you, Raquel, is that you're never out of ideas. Um, so I know you have plenty of things to tell us that you'll be doing next. <laughs> yes. Are, are you asking me to tell you? Yes, I'm asking you to tell. <laughs> well, actually, after this today, I'm going to celebrate my book release with my girls at Life is Precious. And it's a suicide prevention program for mm -hmm. Latino American teens. Um, they're located in the Bronx and also in uh, Brooklyn. But I'm working with the girls um, on a film in the Bronx on a documentary um, about ancestral DNA. Um, Latina teens have the highest suicide rate um, in America. And the epicenter of this problem, and I'm, I'm still having a hard time wrapping my head around this, is New York City. Wow. So, wow. yeah, so the only art uh, therapy driven um, uh, solution to this is Life is Precious, and I'm going there to talk to them and to film them and actually to, um, um, to, to uh, reveal one of the uh, test results that I just got back last night. I'm very excited about this. So I'm going to go and, you know, I'm working on this documentary about that. And also, um, I'm working on a, a memoir about gentrification. <laughs> That's not going to be an easy pill to swallow. <laughs> you you got to deal with all them New York hipsters. <laughs> I got to deal with the hipsters. And, you know, unfortunately, a lot of the publishing houses are... You know, <laughs> these people. So yeah, I hear you. But I'm looking at it from a very different angle. There's no for me. I exist in the gray area. I don't exist in the black or in the white. Yeah. So it's yeah. not about you know you're the gentrifier, we're the gentrified. You know, and it's you know you're the boogeyman and we're the poor victim. There's somewhere in between. A There's murkier. a space in yeah. between that I want to explore. We've been joined this afternoon by Raquel Cepeda talking about her brand new book, Bird of Paradise: How I Became Latina, a memoir. She's also the editor of And It Don't Stop, the best hip hop journalism of the last 25 years, director of the documentary Bling a Planet Rock, one time editor of Russell Simmons' One World magazine. Thank you for joining us this afternoon, Raquel. Thank you for having me. I hope this is not the last time. No, it won't be. <laughs> I better keep on producing stuff so you'll have me back on. <laughs> uh, our love to the family, Raquel. Thank you, likewise. Yeah. Eric, you're a real life Eric. G for this one. <laughs> yeah. All black everything. All black, you know. All black in the name of all my black heroes. All black everything. All black polos. All black medallions, yeah. All black, you know, say. All black everything. All black, you know. All black in the name of all my black 